Disco Elysium takes place in a world that is at once both breathtakingly beautiful, yet soul-crushingly melancholic. In this world, you are Harry Dubois, a middle-aged detective called to the district of Martinez in the city of Revachol to investigate a recent murder in the area. The streets of Martinez are a palimpsest of Revachol's recent history. Locals populate the coastal tenements and small businesses, trying to eke out a living for themselves in between the scars of bullets and artillery shells that haunt the area, remnants of massacre and of a failed revolution nearly half a century prior. The people of Martinez go about their lives in the shadow of the Wild Pines shipping harbor nearby, where tensions between the local dock workers' union and the Wild Pines have culminated in an ongoing strike, serious enough that it threatens to turn into a small-scale civil war in Revachol. With reasonable suspicion that the murder you're investigating may have something to do with the ongoing strike, you and your detective partner Kim Kitsuragi are swept up in the local politics of Martinez. But before all of this, Disco Elysium begins, as most role-playing games do, with the act of character creation. The game offers you detective archetypes, or allows you to customize your stats and favorite skills manually, as I've done here. For this playthrough, I've decided to take a jack-of-all-trades approach with my stats, so that my character can be good at a little bit of everything, with picking Shivers as my favorite skill. The description of Shivers reads, Raise the hair on your neck. Tune into the city. Shivers come when the temperature drops and you become more keenly aware of your surroundings. It enables you to hear the city itself, to truly belong to the streets. It is a supernatural ability. Old wrongs play out in present time. Scenes across the city happen in front of you. But who is speaking to you? With the act of character creation finished, the game launches you into this. There is nothing, only warm primordial blackness. Your conscious ferments in it, no larger than a single grain of malt. You don't have to do anything anymore. Ever. Never. Never, ever, ever, baby. An inordinate amount of time passes. It is utterly void of struggle. No ex-wives are contained within it. Yes, it is. An awareness creeps up on you. A mass lies hidden in your dead angle. Soaking in some lurid acidic sauce, it's bloated and shameful, a ball of meat surrounding you. This is a terrible line of questioning, and it will only lead to more awareness of the meat thing. There. No ball of meat. No light in the formless nothing. Just nice women. Coming right up, sir. Smooth passage. Do you really? You wouldn't like it if I told you what was back there. Why'd you think you had to bludgeon yourself into oblivion? Or did you not sense yourself marinating? Poured so much on yourself, got a bit carried away, did we, Chef? Fear and apprehension. You should ask yourself there first. There's this giant ball there. An evil apes. And the evil apes are juking it out on the ball. You're one of them. It's basically all just evil apes juking it out on a giant ball. 
You can't even make out it's a ball when you're joking it out. It's that large. Infinitesimally small. Fine for resources. It's just a stupid expression you picked up somewhere. The part of the presentation you want to take home with you is this. You have to beat the other evil apes in the face. Or you lose. Yes, it is. And you drowned in that sadness a long time ago. Lost. Right away, something is unusual with your character. You awake from your bizarre dream conversation about ex-wives and evil apes duking it out on a ball, to find yourself in an unfamiliar and thoroughly trashed hotel room. Cold wind blows in from a broken window, clothes and alcohol bottles litter the room around you, and a broken faucet fills the bathroom with steam and clouds up the mirror. Investigating through context clues, you come to realize that you literally have no idea where you are, what happened the night before, or even who you are. If this were your first time playing the game, you would know none of the information that I included at the beginning of this video, without having done outside research, of course. Other characters are willing to fill you in on missing details in varying degrees, like your partner Kim, who reminds you that you are an officer of the RCM, or Revachol Citizens Militia, who is supposed to be investigating the death of a man hanging from a tree behind the hotel, or the hotel owner Gart, who is mad at you for having spent the whole weekend running up a bar tab, scaring away customers and trashing your hotel room. On top of all this, you quickly realize that you are missing both your gun and your identification badge, rendering it impossible to give either character your name. Right away, the game saddles you with three pressing objectives. Begin the murder investigation that you have been putting off all weekend. Find 130 real, which is the game's form of currency. To pay Gart so you aren't kicked out of your hotel room. And figure out who exactly you are. This player character identity crisis is one of the first major aspects of the game I want to focus on here. The Throneness of Harry Dubois With its heavily prescribed approach to protagonist characterization, Disco Elysium eschews many of the expectations that modern role-playing game players may have come to expect from character creation. Oftentimes, in games like this, players are given a very high degree of control in the ability to shape their characters however they please. It is often praised as a feature of an RPG when character creation is as detailed as possible, including everything from numerous options for your character's sex, appearance, age, voice, and even sometimes backstory. Then, in some cases, these choices will go on to inform the unfolding of the game's narrative in particular ways that makes players feel as if they've gotten a truly unique experience in their playthrough of a game. Disco Elysium does none of these things only allowing you to make choices regarding what talents you want your character to have, which even then might only marginally increase the odds of doing the things you want to do. Skill checks throughout the game operate on a dice-based system, after all, meaning that certain choices will never be off-limits to players, only more or less likely depending on their stats. And rather than just lacking a backstory, you come to gradually realize that your detective, Harry Dubois, has actually led a life of 44 years before we meet him at the beginning of the game. Looking for your badge, finding mementos from your past, talking to the people of Martinez. These tasks chip away at the amnesiac shell surrounding Harry's consciousness, digging up traumas from the past and forcing both you and Harry to confront the sad reality of his life. 
and the reason he's descended into alcoholism. Slowly, over the course of the game, Harry's tragic past becomes apparent to you. Thin wax paper has been glued to a piece of cardboard. Sounds like leaves rustling when you pick it up. You see violet flowers, floral patterns, patches of glue. It smells of chewing gum, apricot flavored. A touch of cinnamon, the end of summer. You think the label says tutti frutti. Familiar handwriting lines the inside of the card, looped round letters in a woman's hand. Harry, it begins. You're already reading. I wanted to write you a letter so you can read it when you wake up. Maybe it will make you happy. Throw it away, please. Your hand shakes holding the card. Every morning when I step out and you're asleep behind me, it says, I find a little piece of sadness in me. I carry it in my chest, down Voyager Road. Every step I take, it grows. By the time I reach the fuel station, it has filled me entirely. I step onto the light rail and look back. Sparks fall from the bow collector. I know it will be like this until late afternoon when I get off the 42 and walk back to you. You, you, every step I take will get lighter. It almost makes me run. Sometimes I do. I can't believe I met you. I can't believe the happiness I feel with you. You have a vast, vast soul and I will always, always, always come back to it. Kisses, kisses, kisses. You feel the air sucked out of your lungs and the blood sucked out of your head. Everything around you gets dark. Small white dots appear. You feel the ledger slip from your hand. On the corner of Voyager and Main, a large neon sign hangs on the side of a building. Video Revishol, 24 hours. It's raining and there is almost no traffic on the street. A woman's footprints in the mud lead away from the front door. Tiny heels tiptoeing down the road. Beautiful steps, light-footed with a lifetime ahead of them. You look up and the air seems to grow darker. Suddenly you feel like you don't want to hear about video rentals anymore. You don't want to hear about any of it. It was all shit. It's over. Small. The dearest thing you've ever heard. Hello? you're calling me. You seem drunk. Oh, God. That's it, yes. We've talked about it a million times. You will get over it, just like I did. People do. Things will get good for you again. It just takes some time. For you, I think it will take something like 20 years, maybe? It was hard for me too, you know? I used to think I couldn't live without you. But I can. No, Harry. We can't. 
We already tried again, and it didn't work. Harry Dubois, a sad, divorced drunk who would rather wallow in his misery and hold on to the past than face the day-to-day -day struggle of his own reality. This is who you are in Disco Elysium. You are given no choice in the matter. Rather than considering this a flaw of Disco Elysium's game design, that players cannot let their characters be a vessel for themselves, I believe that this limitation in the player's control is actually a brilliant decision, one that fits the game's larger themes of finitude and contingency. To borrow a concept from the German philosopher Martin Heidegger, there is a real way in which you as the player have been thrown into the world of Disco Elysium. Thrownness is a condition of being in the world for Heidegger that describes the impossibly complex ways in which subjects relate to and are conditioned by the world they take part in. Our thrownness as human beings is non-negotiable, as it is the very condition upon which we exist. There is no transcending it. Freedom and the possibility of choice can only arise from an understanding of the terms of our conditioning and of the ways in which we are already limited in our being. Disco Elysium forces you to confront this thrownness by forcing you to be Harry Dubois. You are not a floating Cartesian subject, removed from the world and capable of totally deciding who you are. Rather than inserting yourself into this game world from nowhere and from nothing, you assume the role of a man who pre-exists the game's narrative proper and who is already in the middle of his own life story. All you can do is accept who you are, pick up this story where it leaves off, and try your best to figure out where it goes from here. Because of this, you are forced to come to terms with who you are as Harry Dubois before you can really make decisions about who you may still become. Disco Elysium makes this apparent in a number of ways, perhaps the most prominent of which is the way that Harry's body, your body, often behaves autonomously, like when muscle memory carries you through dialing a phone number or even refuses to listen to you, shutting down at moments, even urging you to feed dangerous drug and alcohol addictions. It's just that your heart has finally pumped all the speed out of your system, Buster. Time to get some more. Don't do that. Stay strong. The hangover will wear off. You don't need to keep doing this to yourself. Are you sure? Ready to live as this pathetic shell of yourself for days? Basically, a week. Let's be honest, two weeks. Maybe three. You won't make it. Half the town will be dead by then. You will be fired. Suit yourself, slow, sad shell man. See how you do without your spark. Even further, Harry's mind is often at odds with itself as different aspects of his personality will argue amongst themselves during conversations, urging you to pick one dialogue option or another and often contradicting themselves. But it's not just Harry's limitations that make Disco Elysium so special to play, it's the whole world's. This leads me to the next of the game's aspects that I want to talk about. Finitude and the anti-power fantasy. Disco Elysium often threatens to overwhelm players with information about the world in which the game takes place. The game's people, locations, books, thoughts even, dump expository information on you in relentless amounts, only exacerbated by your need to ask questions, both in relation to your investigation and your lost identity. Beyond a certain point, it sort of becomes difficult to keep track of this world's history through its myriad centuries, wars, political shifts, and major events. Significant names, dates, corporations, and sovereign powers, they all blend into each other in an often arcane word salad that the game just dumps in your lap for daring to ask questions about the world you live in. And yet, 
me raising this argument is not a knock against how Disco Elysium handles world building, but actually an admiration of it. Speaking at least for myself, I had to learn early on in playing the game how to decide what information was important to me as a player, and what wasn't. The amount of time and effort it would really require to map out the game's world, history, and political powers extends far beyond what the game asks of you, and what is actually important to the game's narrative. I get the sense that this is probably by design. Sure, there are characters like Joyce Messier, who will offer to give you an extensive lowdown on reality in response to your jamais vu, personally one of my favorite conversations in the entire game. But even she rejects the epistemological authority to pass judgment on this world's history. Oh, you want a picture of the world? There is no complete set yet, dear. They're having some trouble reaching orbit. Great things are difficult to achieve. For now, we're viewing the world from the inside, sideways. No matter who you're asking, there is no bird's eye view, omniscient perspective, from which the game world can be seen. Only that of Harry Dubois, who is an unreliable narrator at best, and the locale of Martinez, at least whatever it chooses to reveal to you. Disco Elysium challenges players to resist the desire to become omniscient, to understand everything, read every book, ask every question, open every door, the game will intentionally mock you and frustrate your attempts to do so. You rattle the handle a bit, then push on the door with all your weight. It does not budge. Not only is it locked, it's also jammed shut. We don't get in there. Frankly, you're just going to have to accept the fact that you can't get in through every single door. No, no. We've gotten into every door thus far. That's what we do. We open doors. We're cops. That's our perk. Even Everard knew that's a part of our M.O. Relax. No one's hiding in there. If we can't open it. Others can't either, and thus they can't get in. In a way, this approach to the accumulation of knowledge is actually quite true to the real world as well. You only have so much time in your life after all, not enough to internalize our universe's history, granting that all of that information would be readily available to you in the first place. Figuring out what information is valuable to hold on to and what isn't is a skill that each of us has to learn when confronted by our limited time on Earth and the inevitability of our death. In this same way, players must each learn how to decide what is important to Harry Dubois. This is another of the many ways in which Disco Elysium subverts modern role-playing game genre conventions. Normally, games like this would encourage players to exhaust all their dialogue options, explore every corner of every dungeon, read every book or listen to every audio tape, and so on. Doors in role-playing games exist to be opened, after all. Even a quick peek into the game's subreddit on online forums will find players expressing their disappointment that the game does not allow you to open that bunker door. If I had to wager a guess, it is that players have often come to expect the experience of a power fantasy from the price tag of a role-playing game. Games that let you be anyone go anywhere, do anything, express an unconscious desire for transcendence and for an absolute freedom that is missing from our real lives. So many role-playing games see their protagonists ascend to godhood before the credits roll, putting players into the role of sovereign or chosen one and asking them to pass judgment on the fate of the game world and decide its future. To the contrary, Disco Elysium makes it clear from the get-go that you are literally no one of significance to the larger world. You've been born too late to take part in the revolution that decided the fate of Rivashol, 
and as players, you've entered the story too late to even prevent Harry from ruining his own life. These are unimportant times, Detective. You and I were born after the dust had settled. A thousandth of a second too late. For the big time. The smile of a predator. No doubt what she's got in mind. The revolution. It's quite easy. Every hundred years or so, our species gets together to decide what's next, who gets shot in the head, and who gets the mineral rights. It's a real... kerfuffle. Even the one thing you've been tasked with solving, the murder mystery at the heart of the game's narrative, eludes your grasp with each new lead, each new complication. Meanwhile, the clock steadily ticks away in the bottom right-hand corner of the screen reminding you that escalating tensions in Martinez threaten to disrupt the whole city if your investigation doesn't produce fruitful results in a timely manner. Explore Martinez, talk with the locals, listen to their stories and help them out when possible. Chase down every possible lead you can think of, it doesn't matter. Time passes all the same, and by the time you've gotten anywhere close to solving the case, the reckoning comes to Martinez in the form of the Mercenary Tribunal. Hired guns from the Wild Pines arrive to take vengeance for their fallen comrade, the murder victim whom everyone believes has been lynched by the local dock workers' union. Get lost, comedian. You cops had your chance. Now it's fucking time for some justice. Big fuck! People are gonna die today. We're not leaving it like this. These tribals hung him up for everyone to see. No one is going to kill anyone. Let's just put the guns down and talk like civilized human beings. With a wordless gurgle, the killer loads his long rifle. The leader gives a small nod to the helmeted man. Suddenly, the grip of your sidearm feels comforting and warm in your hand. Feels like it's saying, do it. Shoot him in the mouth. Shoot him before he shoots you. Even if it comes to a fight, it's always a good idea to drag it out first. Get under his skin. I don't know about this getting under his skin. What if he gets under yours? I'm barely keeping your hand from trembling here. Peace, always peace. It has worked thus far. Start with the first idea you have, then move down from that. Please. I'm talking about the case. They don't care. A plume of smoke and fire erupts from the gun and your hand goes numb from the explosion. The smoke drifts west with the wind. You hear the plaza erupt in violence, slow like a waterfall in reverse. To your right, the killer raises his rifle and takes aim at you. His moves are steady, but the long barrel of the rifle sways slowly. You leap left. A swing and lead passes mere millimeters from your side, tearing fabric off your coat. Feels like the lightest of tucks. The man tilts his head, trying to see through the clearing smoke for the next shot. Watch out. To your left. Nepal is about to take a shot too, at Kim. God, please. Two shots ring at once. One from the lieutenant's pistol, and the other from De Paul's. It's aimed at the lieutenant, but it misses. You hear a scream behind you. Glenn, dying in a puddle of blood behind you. 
His mangled torso has two gunshot wounds. Blood gushes out of them like red geezers. You see two crazed eyes stare at you through all the smoke and the panic. With blood gushing from his face, the man raises his pistol at you. Then he squeezes the trigger. The look of vengeance, framed in blood, lips shaking. This is the last thing he'll do on Earth. But he will do it. He is your end. Here it comes, death. Even with the best possible choices in the investigation thus far, and even with succeeding all the possible skill checks, six people dead in the Martinez Town Square is the best outcome you can achieve. At this point in the game, you've officially hit rock bottom. Your reasonable leads have all gone cold or skipped town. None of the information seems to add up, and the confrontation you were hoping to prevent has already occurred. On a whim, you and Kim set out to pursue the last long-shot hypothesis left in your case, hoping for a miracle. Fatalism and Doomed Futures Before we get to the game's ending, I want to talk a little bit more about how Disco Elysium conditions players to expect disappointment. Not in the game or its writing, mind you, which I think are both brilliant, obviously, or I wouldn't be making this video. Rather, Disco Elysium conditions you to expect disappointment in the often depressing ways in which its stories play out. One side quest sees you explore a building supposedly haunted by a curse that causes every business opened in it to fail. Results inconclusive. Another side quest sees you convincing a local woman that her husband is missing and in need of finding, only to find his corpse all alone on a pier by the coast, having slipped while drunk in the rain. Yet a third side quest sees you assist a local cryptozoologist in attempting to track down the elusive Insulindian Phasmid, whom a woman in the hotel tells you she saw once as a child, only to find all of the traps empty with no sign of the Phasmid, prompting you to abandon the quest. You can try and fail early on to convince Kim that there is a dark, sexy twist behind the murder investigation, or that every insignificant detail you come across relates to the investigation in some grand, conspiratorial way. Even in the small moments where things do play out unexpectedly well, like when a seemingly insignificant door in the hotel kitchen turns out to actually be important to the investigation, the results are often mundane and believably realistic enough that they don't serve to lift the slowly encroaching sense of nihilism that the game has been building from the start. In fact, Disco Elysium kind of makes it hard to imagine that the future could possibly be better at all. Here, at the end of history, the material basis for revolution has seemingly fallen out. All that is left to the people of Rivashol is the suffocating tedium of life under the ultra-liberal capitalist modernity that has emerged as the clear victor of history. This game very much embodies theorist Mark Fisher's problematic of capitalist realism, that it is easier to imagine the end of the world than an end to capitalism. Surely enough, this is literally true for the game world. Over the course of the game, players have the opportunity to let Harry pursue a myriad of political philosophies, including everything from radical communism to hardcore liberalism to even unrepentant fascism. No matter what the player's own political leanings, the game will ceaselessly mock you for whatever your political affiliations are. Harry's attempts at expressing political stances never approach genuine, thoughtful argumentation, mostly dwelling somewhere between pure, dogmatic expressions of ideology and bizarre pantomimes written for the express purpose of satirizing the stance itself. The game seems to want to tell you that whatever you think you know about how to fix the world, that your ideas just aren't good enough. Good. You're up. Listen, there's something that's been bothering you for a few days now. It's a suspicion, or a feeling really, that things are not quite in hand around here. 
An earth-shattering deduction from your psyche. What will those guys come up with next? Every day, things seem to spin more and more wildly, out of control. The center isn't holding. And despite your efforts to moderate and contain these energies, things only seem to be getting worse. You've got to find out who bears la responsabilité. The most awesome, terrible thing. It is human nature to crave la responsabilité and to deny it. That's why it must be distributed across many different organizations, agencies, offices, and portfolios. Harry, Harry, you're thinking about this too narrowly. La responsabilité isn't concerned with trivial questions like who killed who. It's about the real issues, the human welfare index, the price of staple goods, the transition to real democracy. Whoa, whoa, whoa. This isn't some kind of dictatorship. You can simply seize la responsabilité for yourself. It must be given by a legitimate authority, like a committee. Only the most even-keeled minds in Martinez. Your half-brother, the lieutenant, is a natural place to start. Together, you'll be able to discover who has la responsabilité in Rivershaw. And, if necessary, you'll have the wisdom and expertise to assign it among yourselves. Most likely, your findings will be collected in a report which will be carefully reviewed by your superiors. Once they've reviewed it, those same superiors will produce a set of recommendations to be taken up at the next meeting of the Standing Committee. Rest assured, no matter what happens, it will be done through the proper channels. Good luck. Your report is eagerly anticipated. On the other hand, should players find themselves too engrossed with the large-scale details of this world and its cosmology, Joyce Messier will readily provide you with information about how the world actually has no future. They say there is a rarefied envelope of matter surrounding the darkened disk of our planet. That is, if we are still living on a planet. Or, to speak more plainly, Imagine vast swathes of land disrupted by nothingness. I am sorry, dear. It must sound quite terrifying through the acute encephalopathy. Even scientific positivism isn't entirely convinced about what we're dealing with here. The Pale is not, technically speaking, part of reality. It is the opposite of reality. Okay. The Pale is the most dominant geological feature of the world, Detective. The separative tissue between the Islas. It is the inter mass. Imagine a grey coronal mist, cold vapour marked by spores of an opportunistic microorganism. A mould that's adapted to grow at the edge of the unrest. It's... Uh, the most disco thing you will ever see. You hear your pulse rise. The air feels caustic and cold suddenly. The pale outweighs reality two to one. There is more pale than there is matter, and the ratio is slipping. What do you think, Detective? Precisely. 
One of the few measurable effects of the pale is that it is expanding at an unknown rate. An intuitive conclusion of that development is that one day the pale will cover everything. But this sort of talk is mostly left to extremists. Most people, and indeed most private and government sector organizations, entire civilizations and religions even, find handy ways to ignore or downplay that knowledge. I suggest you do the same. The Pale. Much like our real-world dilemma of looming climate catastrophe and the even larger problem of our universe's steady trend towards entropy, seemingly offers an unavoidable end to all things, a return to nothingness itself. When viewed from too large a scale, it can be hard to continue to feel invested in worldly affairs like political struggles and murder investigations. The problem of scale is a problem that the game raises throughout its narrative, even jokingly allowing you to adopt the cop of the apocalypse archetype for Harry as a sort of coping mechanism for the miserable state of his life, informing everyone who will listen about the fast approaching end of the world and the doom that awaits us all, or allowing you to internalize thoughts that try and distance Harry from his traumatic past, humorously reflected by the game allowing you to zoom out 20% farther. This scale problem is one that Disco Elysium doesn't provide players with a clear solution for. Instead, allowing players to figure out for themselves how to process the seemingly non-negotiable fact that their world has no future. Personally, I'd wager a guess that most players didn't respond to news of the pale with a, well, that's it I guess, and stop playing the game. I think there are ludonarrative implications for this. Most players find ways to stay invested in the game world, resisting the urge to zoom out to a scale that renders all of human existence meaningless. Again, this is another problem that is not simply limited to the world of Disco Elysium, but extends to our own real world too. Our own individual struggles are rendered seemingly insignificant when viewed with too much distance, something which is also true of humanity's struggles as well. The German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche once wrote that, Once upon a time, in some out-of-the-way corner of that universe which is dispersed into numberless twinkling solar systems, there was a star upon which clever beasts invented knowing. That was the most arrogant and mendacious minute of world history, but nevertheless, it was only a minute. After nature had drawn a few breaths, the star cooled and congealed, and the clever beasts had to die. One might invent such a fable, and yet he still would not have adequately illustrated how miserable, how shadowy and transient, how aimless and arbitrary the human intellect looks within nature. There were eternities which it did not exist, and when it is all over with the human intellect, nothing will have happened. If your mind automatically recalled the phrase, evil apes duking it out on a ball, you're not alone. Certainly, while Nietzsche's statement may be true in his observation that humans are only a recently emergent player in our universe, and will almost surely cease to exist at some point or another, it is also worth stating that there is no correct scale from which to view these things, as much as it is true that small-scale personal issues don't matter on a universal scale. So too is it true that universal issues that play out over radically non-human time frames often don't really matter on a personal scale. For whatever reason, news that climate catastrophe or even entropy might present an existential threat to humanity isn't enough to make everyone go home and kill themselves. And I think whatever reason people find to go on when presented with dilemmas on these often radically inhuman time scales, the same reason can be found within players' decisions to see Disco Elysium through to its end, whether it be a morbid curiosity to see how it all unravels, or whether it be lingering hope for the possibility of a miracle, despite the game's attempts to grind down whatever optimism and excitement for the future the player once had. Miracles and the New At the end of the line, players finally come face to face with the murderer responsible for setting into motion the entirety of Disco Elysium's central narrative. 
against all odds, and in defiance of basically every thread you've followed over the course of your investigation, the murder is nothing short of an act of God. A communist deserter holdover from the revolution nearly half a century ago, hiding on an island off the coast of Martinez, who took an insane shot with his sniper rifle when he saw the Wild Pines mercenary through his long-distance scope. The details of your complicated investigation were muddled by confused attempts at a cover-up when no one in Martinez could really explain what had happened. Despite your attempts to be the best detective you could possibly be, the investigation finally comes to a close after once more confronting you with the disappointing absurdity of the world. No grand conspiracies here. No false flag lynching. No union worker vigilantism. Just an anachronistic old man taking a lucky pot shot with his last bullet for whatever selfish justification he can fall back on. With your arrival, the deserter offers his unconditional surrender, after 43 years in hiding, finally giving up on the dream of communist revolution and Rivachol. But then, something truly magical happens. A delicate tangle of arms and legs unfolds from the reeds, limb by limb, to then just stand there, moving its scythe-like arms in ghostly silence. It's still there, an unfolding mechanism of reed-like chitin hovering in place. What are you talking about? There. The stick insect is over three meters tall. It looks straight at you with its tiny pinprick eyes and its grotesquely small head. You feel your legs shaking under you and your gun hand rise instinctively. See what exactly? A bug? I can see it. Four simple words, thank God. If he can see, then you're not insane. But that means it's really there, spinning slowly, in absolute silence, its limbs long and slender. Be very, very careful. The creature stands on long stilt-like legs, antennae hanging from his head like a woman's hair, white and curled at the tips. It is no more than five steps away from you. Reed-like tufts stick out of its joints. As the insect moves its forearms, it produces a faint hiss, like a reel-to-reel -reel machine spinning after the tape breaks. It is. You glance over your shoulder. The lieutenant holds a piece of milled aluminium. He begins to pull it open extremely carefully. It's the camera. No, the flash will scare the creature off. Warn him now. We need a photo. No one will believe us. From the corner of your eye, you see a sudden cascade of motion ripple through the phasmid's limbs. A series of ultrasonic clicks fills your ear. I am not palatable. Do not eat me. I am afraid. I won't be one of those fools who didn't take a picture. You see the phasmid turn to him. Its mandible antennae reaching out. Its motions are quick, sudden. The spindly mechanism turns itself back to you, its antennae taking their measure of the air, slowly.
nothing changes in the cyclical brain motion of the creature's limbs. They are porcelain white on the inside and reed colored on the out, beige, light brown and striped. You are unsure if it is scared or not. Slowly, with your breath held, you take two small steps toward the phasmid. The creature lets out a series of ultrasonic clicks that swarm around your head like swallows. I you. Tell me what it's like for you. Fire? Where? That is your problem. Nothing ever ends for me. There is only room for two, maybe three pictures in my mind. For me, it is a series of half-lit images. A kind of darkness being intruded upon. Transient, dim. Against all odds, against everything that Disco Elysium has taught you to expect from it thus far, the miracle arrives. The Insulindian Phasmid, the creature that no one believed existed except for the local cryptozoologists, arrives to meet you at the end of your journey. This face-to-face -face meeting with the Insulindian Phasmid is so much more than just a weird occurrence in a weird game. It is the very condition upon which hope for the future of the world rests. As I've argued, Disco Elysium is a game that spends nearly its entire playtime grinding down whatever optimism about the world the player may have begun the game to begin with. It tells you, again and again, that things will only get worse, that nothing you do or experience will ever matter to anyone, that nothing magical or miraculous will ever happen. Yet here, at the eleventh hour of the game, the presence of the Insulindian Phasmid provides the clearest and most powerful refutation of the game's merciless nihilism up to this point. Something magical has happened, and better yet, Kim is present with his camera to prove to the world that this really happened, validating the experience which otherwise could have just been written off as another one of Harry's drunk delusions. Put simply, the Insulindian Phasmid being real and revealing itself to you demonstrates that miracles are still possible in this magical and mysterious world. In the same way that Disco Elysium asks players to resist the desire of omniscience for the sake of control, the game now asks that players resist the pessimistic pseudo-omniscience that assures us that things will only play out in the worst possible way. There is still room for hope that the world is more wondrous, weirder, and more magical than we can even begin to imagine. New ideas, new politics, new ways of seeing the world may yet still be revealed to us, offering us hope for a future where it currently seems there is none. Even the pale the phasmid reveals to us is potentially human in origin, and may well not represent an existential threat to all of reality after all. This doesn't mean that we should turn around and reinscribe a belief in the immortality of humanity, but perhaps it is cause for a modest celebration to know that perhaps the world doesn't have to end tomorrow. How much of this is wishful thinking and how much of it is reasonable, either for the game world or for our own? Who can say for sure at the end of the day? But if there is one thing that Disco Elysium's ending makes clear, it is that things could still get better. That miracles are always possible. And perhaps that enough is cause for celebration. No, there is one more. Thank you. I also have one more thing to say to you. That woman, turn from the ruin, turn and go forward, do it for the working class. The shrill flash of the camera 
cuts the air like the blade of a sword. The phasmid freezes in its bright light. Head turned toward the lieutenant, hypnotized by the flash. It stands frozen before you. The sweat on your arms feels cold as ice, as if you're frozen as well, in the shadow of this great statue of chitinous marble. I got it. 